Good afternoon to all. Um, before we start this afternoon's uh, lecture, may I just uh, mention a, a, a few acknowledgements. Um, I would like to, to acknowledge uh, the people who are uh, behind this Pals Live uh, lecture uh, for this year. Um, I, we want everybody to know this because, well, um, they have worked tirelessly to bring all these lectures to, to your homes, especially in these uh, uncertain times. Uh, may I take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, the president of the Philippine Association of Law Schools, Dean Mary Anineas of the Universidad de Manila College of Law uh, for spearheading uh, this, this PALS Live lecture. Uh, uh, this is her brainchild. And uh, she suggested it to, to all the deans uh, of the Philippine Association of Law Schools, especially uh, the Board of Trustees. And uh, uh, we owe uh, this opportunity to continue our learning um, um, to her leadership as president of the Philippine Association of Law Schools. May I also take this opportunity to, to thank and to acknowledge uh, the efforts, uh, the tireless efforts of Dean Al Shwaid Ismael of the University of Cebu College of Law, um, as well as Dean Rosan Gonzaga of the University of St. LaSalle uh, College of Law. Um, they are the co-chairpersons of uh, the Committee on uh, Special Interests and Special Concerns of the Philippine Association of Law Schools. And uh, it is through their technical expertise and their efforts at, at marketing this um, this regular uh, feature since uh, um, uh, since two weeks ago, um, their their efforts here are are uh, um, are well appreciated by. Um, all your deans, all your law professors are constantly thinking about you, uh, especially in these times. It is uh, not only a national emergency. Uh, and for this, um, um, I would like to, to acknowledge uh, the efforts of our fellow deans and the board of trustees of the Philippine Association of Law Schools for giving their time to this uh, uh, worthwhile uh, event. Uh, once again, uh, good afternoon to all. Um, our lecture for today involves the Constitution in times of national emergency. We live in turbulent times. It is in these, um, in these times when certain responses must be made, especially by our governmental authorities. Even in times of national emergency, even in turbulent times, the Constitution remains operative. The challenge that we face 
when it comes to living by the principles of constitutionalism is to strike a balance, a delicate balance between the liberty and security provisions of the Constitution. I would like to call this as somewhat of um, balancing the constitutional tightrope between the Constitution and the Constitution of Government. Likewise, um, this lecture attempts to, to, to put some sense out of um, a seemingly chaotic situation. But Um, we, we will weather this storm. We are all into this together, and this is the time to be divided. This is rather the time to be united. But in that spirit of unity, we need to balance the needs of liberty and security as embodied our Constitution. Now the first question on your mind, on all our minds, is what is a national emergency? A national emergency is an emergency that is uh, notes the existence of certain conditions, national in scope and magnitude, suddenly in intensifying uh, existing danger to life as well as the security of the state. Um, a national emergency would coincide with um, situation and the nation may be at peril. The life, the security of the nation is at peril. Beyond the degree of what we normally do. In other words, in an emergency, our normal lives are disrupted. So this disruption for, uh, uh, this disruption from our normal way of life, uh, calls for extraordinary measures. And these extraordinary measures in times of national emergency are the emergency powers that are reposed in our and delegated our president, who is the chief executive of the Republic of the Philippines. As contemplated by the Constitution, the Supreme Court said that these emergency conditions may include rebellion, invasion, lawless violence, economic crisis, pestilence, or pandemics. Typhoons, floods, and other natural disasters, and other similar types of catastrophic events of nationwide proportions or effect. Now, in a, a national emergency, as perceived by our legislature, or our chief executive is occasioned by a wide range of uh, situations, which may be classified into uh, three kinds, three principal kinds. First involves an economic emergency. Second involves a natural disaster uh, emergency. 
and third involves national uh, security. Now, um, we will, uh, as the discussion goes on, we will have a uh, uh, cate cat categorization of uh, national emergencies. And, and um, I would like everyone to pay uh, close attention to it. Uh, it's important that we are able to characterize uh, the national emergency that has, that, uh, that has uh, arisen in order to come out with uh, the, the, the appropriate solutions to resolving and ending that national emergency. From a constitutional uh, standpoint, a national emergency is a crisis of national proportions that threatens the peace, good order, security, and safety of a nation. A national emergency requires a swift and decisive response to meet the exigencies of the moment. Now, you may ask, which branch of government does the Constitution repose uh, emergency powers? Or which branch of government is the repository of uh, emergency powers? Clearly, Congress is authorized by the Constitution to delegate such emergency powers to the President. This is the constitutional basis of um, um, a national emergency which is laid down in Article 6, Section 23, Paragraph 2 of the Constitution. Under what conditions can emergency powers be exercised? The following conditions must concur to, the, to warrant the exercise of emergency powers under Article 20, um, 23, paragraph two of the constitution. There must be war or other national emergency. Second, Congress must authorize the president to exercise emergency powers for a limited period. Third, the authority granted to the president to exercise emergency powers must be subject to the restrictions prescribed by the Constitution. The powers must be necessary and proper to meet the existing emergency. And finally, these emergency powers must be exercised to carry out a declared national policy. Under David versus Arroyo, there were only four requisites that were contained therein. But for purposes of this lecture and for purposes of understanding fully the conditions by which a national, uh, in which uh, emergency powers can be invoked, um, it should should contain at least one more um, uh, condition. Um, David versus Arroyo only provided for four. Um, in this discussion, we provided for a fifth. Uh, condition. The powers must be necessary and proper.
to meet the existing emergency. What are the powers exercised by the president in times of national uh, emergency? The president under Article 7 of the Constitution exercises executive power. Under Article 7, Section 1, the executive power is vested in the president of the Republic of the Philippines. However, the powers provided for under Article 7 are the regular or ordinary powers that are given, or the X powers that are given President um, times of peace. Uh, in times of, uh, of stability. However, there are certain powers that are delegated by Congress uh, to the president that uh, are emergency powers that are necessary and proper to meet the existing emergency. Now, the executive power of the president is uh, in Article 7 includes the power of appointment, the regular powers, the, the ordinary powers of the president include uh, the power of appointment, the power of general supervision over local government units, the power of control over the agencies, bureaus, and offices, under the executive department. The commander in chief powers, which are express powers provided for under Article 7, uh, Section 18. And the powers by necessary implication from these express or ordinary powers of the president. With respect to national emergency powers, we cannot overemphasize the importance of Congress in delegating its legislative power to the president to meet the exigencies of the time. Now let's go to, uh, let's, let's discuss a, a, the constitutional history of national emergencies. Um, in, in our discussion, we are looking at uh, the use of national emergency powers from the 1940s uh, to, the pre to the present. Now in the, in the 1940s, in 19, 1944, uh, you would have a, a declaration of martial law. Uh, by, the, by President Jose P. Laurel then um, during the Japanese occupation of, of the Philippines. The declaration included, the declaration of a state of martial law included as well the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus. In 1949, uh, President Quirino, Elpidio Quirino suspended the privilege of the writ uh, the, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus in some parts of Luzon to quell uh, the rebellion of uh, the Hukbalahap uh, uh, guerrillas. Uh, Commonwealth Act number 671, which was known as the Emergency Powers Act was passed by Congress, declaring a state of total emergency. Uh, well, uh, Commonwealth Act number 671 was, was uh, um, enacted before the war. And so uh, for the duration of the war, there was a state of total emergency by, by uh, the government in exile, led by President Quezon and Vice President uh, Osmeña. 
So a state of total emergency as a result of the Second World War was declared and authorized the president then, President Quezon, to promulgate rules and regulations to meet uh, the emergency. Later on, during the Japanese occupation, um, um, the president, uh, um, during the Japanese occupation, President Jose P. Laurel um, declared uh, martial law to restore uh, order in the Philippines. And uh, well, with the impending uh, invasion of allied forces, uh, um, martial law was declared to, 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 um, to, to protect uh, law and order. Now in, in, in 1971, uh, President Marcos uh, suspended the writ of uh, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus uh, in the entire country in the aftermath of the um, Plaza Miranda bombing. Uh, after which uh, a proclamation was made um, declaring uh, martial law one year after. So the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus was suspended uh, in August 21st, uh, 1971. One year later, in September 21, 23, uh, 1972, uh, martial law was declared in the entire Philippines. In 1989, the aftermath of uh, the 1989 uh, coup attempt against uh, the administration of President Corazon Aquino, um, President Aquino, a few days later, about a week later, uh, the coup attempt started, the coup attempt was launched on December 1st and uh, um, uh, President Aquino um, made a, uh, a proclamation declaring a state of uh, emergency. After which, um, two weeks later, uh, Congress uh, passed Republic Act 6826, granting emergency powers to the president. In 1993, uh, Congress passed Republic Act number 7648 by declaring a, a uh, national emergency um, due to the electric power crisis uh, prevalent uh, in the Philippines at the time. Um, and this was uh, eventually signed by President uh, Fidel V. Ramos. Uh, President Ramos uh, um, certified as urgent the Electric Power Crisis Act to be able to meet that uh, emergency, that economic. during the time of President uh, Arroyo. Um, as well as in 2000 and state of emergency due to uh, The situation, therefore, she declared a, a state of emergency with some alleged uh, uh, military. 2009, state has emerged in certain provinces in preventing and suppressing lawless for
have declared uh, a state of martial law in, in uh, the province of uh, Maguindanao. She likewise suspended the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus uh, therein. Now, in recent times, uh, in 2017, uh, times which we are more familiar with because they are of recent vintage, um, President uh, Rodrigo Duterte um, proclaimed a state of martial law and suspended the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus in uh, Mindanao due to uh, incidents involving um, uh, the ISIS uh, uh, siege of Marawi. In 2018, one year, um, 2018, uh, martial law was uh, extended a year later. Now, for the present time, well, uh, Presidential Proclamation number 922, which was issued uh, earlier this year, proclaimed a state of public health emergency in which uh, Republic Act 11332 uh, was rendered operative to meet that public health emergency. A few days later, a state of calamity was, uh, was, was proclaimed. Subsequently, after these two presidential proclamations, um, Congress enacted Republic Act number 11469, which declared a state of national emergency. It was Congress this time that declared a state of national emergency, which provided emergency powers uh, that were necessary and proper for the president to meet the national emergency. Now, at this point, um, I wanted to, to, to share my observations regarding this, uh, this series of, of declarations. If you will notice, since the 1940s, there were only two instances that did not require the outright exercise of the commander-in-chief powers of the Constitution. The declared emergency necessitated in these two instances were either an economic or civil, uh, civil defense response in the following, in, in, in these uh, uh, situations. First was the economic emergency in 1989 involving the Electric Power Crisis uh, Act. And second, the public health emergency that we are now currently experiencing in order to address uh, the global pandemic brought about by the coronavirus uh, disease. Note that these were the only two instances that did not, that did not invoke the commander in chief powers. 12 out of 14, um, situations which, which, uh, which we discussed involved uh, the invocation of the commander-in-chief powers. Now let's look at uh, the different categories of national emergencies. The first category involved national emergencies necessitating a military defense response. The second category involves national emergencies necessitating a civil defense response. And the third category involves a national emergency necessitating an economic response. If the economy is on the verge of collapse, certain extraordinary powers may be required
perspective if there is an economic recession looming uh, um, that would uh, uh, that would arrest or uh, address rather that would address the seeming need for an economic relief package now let's define these uh, three categories. A civil defense or civil protection emergency contemplates measures to protect citizens of a state from catastrophes. The purpose of these measures is to save lives and to protect property public welfare, public health, and safety, or, less, or to lessen or avert the threat of a catastrophe. It is a system of protective uh, measures and emergency relief activities uh, conducted by civilians in case of either natural disasters, such as uh, pestilence, um, epidemics or pandemics, um, typhoons, floods, or other uh, similar catastrophes. A military defense emergency is an emergency condition necessitating the use of military force, military defensive force, that exists when a major attack is made upon the armed forces either through lawless violence, invasion, or rebellion, where the security of the state, including the lives of the people, are in danger. Finally, an economic emergency contemplates the situation where emergency measures are resorted in order, are resorted to in order to avert an economic crisis and restore the, sub the stability of the national economy, prevent a recession and avert widespread chaos and economic dislocation. may I call your attention to an important aspect of uh, the law on national emergencies, judicial review. And it is important for both lawyers, law students, and aspiring lawyers to know uh, the legal remedies that can be resorted to in court in order to vindicate or recognize uh, rights. When it comes to judicial review, Article 8 Section one is the flagship uh, provision to lay the constitutional basis for judicial review, especially when, when, when a uh, branch or instrumentality of government commits an act that is tainted with grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction. This is known in section one as the grave abuse clause. That is the second uh, part of uh, article eight, section one. So the grave abuse clause must be read in relation to Article 6, Section 23, Paragraph 2, on the delegation of 
emergency powers by Congress to the President, as well as Article 7, Section 18 of the Constitution involving the Commander-in-Chief powers in questioning the sufficiency of the factual basis of the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus or the declaration of martial law. Likewise, the grave abuse clause may be used to, um, in relation to Article 12, Section 17, which involves the power of the state during national emergencies to temporarily take over or direct the operation of any privately owned public utility or business affected with public interest. Likewise, the grave abuse clause uh, involves the protection of the Bill of Rights. Another provision that may be um, subject to, to judicial Araneta versus uh, Dinglazan, the court Okay, um, let's continue. The ruling, however, in Montenegro versus Castaneda was uh, overruled in Lansang versus Garcia. Lansang versus Garcia is, is a, a significant case. It is significant jurisprudence because the power of judicial review that uh, the court, um, um, which, which the court discussed in Lansang versus Garcia found its way into Article 7, Section 18 on the Commander-in-Chief powers, especially with respect to um, um, a, a review of the sufficiency of the factual basis for the declaration of martial law. But it should be noted that in Lansang versus Garcia, uh, what was brought to the fore was um, the issue of whether uh, the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus by the president was uh, is subject to, to judicial review. And so the Supreme Court here, that the power to determine the sufficiency of the factual basis of the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus is a justiciable question, which the court is empowered to determine. However, in the findings of the court in Lansang, although the ruling uh, provided for uh, 
um, judicial review on the determination of the factual basis on the sufficiency of the factual basis for the for the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus uh, the court eventually uh, deemed the suspension to be uh, not unconstitutional with respect to uh, um, uh, the Plaza Miranda uh, bombing. Now in Lansang, uh, this is what the court uh, laid down. Article 7 of the Constitution vests in the executive the power to suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus under specified conditions. Pursuant to the principle of separation of powers underlying our system of government, the executive is supreme within his own sphere. However, the separation of powers under the constitution is not absolute. What is more, it goes hand in hand with the system of checks and balances under which the executive is supreme as regards the suspension of the privilege, but only if and when he acts within the sphere allocate, allotted to him by the constitution or the basic law. And the authority to determine whether or not he has acted is vested in the judicial department, which in this respect is in turn constitutionally supreme. In the exercise of such authority, the function of the court is merely to check in accordance with the system of checks and balances and not to supplant the executive or to ascertain merely whether he had gone beyond the constitutional limits of his jurisdiction, not to the exercise, not to exercise the power vested in him or to determine the wisdom of his act. To be sure, the power of the court to determine the validity of the contested proclamation is far from being identical to or even compar comparable with its power over ordinary civil or criminal cases elevated thereto by ordinary appeal. Even comparable with its power over ordinary civil or criminal cases elevated thereto by ordinary appeal from inferior courts, in which cases the appellate court has all the powers of the court of origin. Lansang versus Garcia. The factual necessity of calling out the armed forces is something that is for the president to decide. He has a vast intelligence network to gather information, some of which may be classified as highly confidential or affecting the security of the state. In the exercise of the power to call out the armed forces, on the spot decisions may be imperatively necessary in emergency situations to avert great loss of human lives and mass destruction of property. Although the court in a proper case may look into the sufficiency of the factual basis of the exercise of this power, the calling out power, on the basis of its power to determine grave abuse of discretion, this is no longer feasible when the proclamation has already been lifted. Integrated Bar of the Philippines versus Zamora. It was rendered mute, moot, uh, sorry. It was rendered moot and academic um, 
because uh, the president uh, lifted that order calling out the armed forces. The court in a proper case may look into the sufficiency of the factual basis of the exercise of uh, this power. However, this is no longer feasible at this time as proclamation number 38 has been lifted in Laxon versus Perez. A state of rebellion was, uh, was declared. But may I uh, invite your attention to this case, San Lacas versus Executive Secretary, where Justice Tina uh, clearly laid down the doctrine of the Commander-in-Chief powers. Article 7, Section 18, grants the President as Commander-in-Chief a sequence of graduated powers. From the most to the least benign, these are the calling out power, the power to suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus, and the power to declare martial law. In the exercise of the latter two powers, the Constitution requires the concurrence of two conditions, namely an actual invasion or rebellion, and that public safety requires the exercise of such power. However, as we observe in Integrated Bar of the Philippines versus Zamora, these conditions are not required in the exercise of the calling out power. The only criteria is that whenever it becomes necessary, the president may call the armed forces to prevent or suppress lawless violence, invasion, or rebellion. In all three instances, from the most to the least benign, from the prevention or suppression of lawless violence, to invasion, to rebellion, Uh, the power of judicial review may be exercised by the Supreme Court in determining the sufficiency of the factual basis for these, uh, for the exercise of these powers. In calling out the armed forces, a declaration of a state of rebellion is an utter superfluity. These are the words of Justice Tinga speaking for the Supreme Court and back. The state of a declaration of a state of rebellion is an utter superfluity. At most, it only gives notice to the nation that such a state exists and that the armed forces may be called to prevent or suppress it. Perhaps the declaration may wreak emotional effects upon the perceived enemies of the state, even on the entire nation. But this court's mandate is to probe only into the legal consequences of the declaration. This court finds that such a declaration is devoid of any legal significance for all intents and for all legal intents. Declaration is deemed not written. Now, um, we go to David versus Arroyo, which is uh, instructive on the power of judicial review. In David versus Arroyo, um, there was a challenge as to the constitutionality of presidential proclamation number 1017. Presidential Proclamation Number 1017 involved a declaration of a state of emergency. The Supreme Court held that Presidential Proclamation 1017 is constitutional in so far as it constitutes a call by President Arroyo on the, on the armed forces of the Philippines to prevent or suppress lawless violence. However, 
the provisions of Presidential Proclamation 1017 commanding the armed forces of the Philippines to enforce obedience to all laws not related to lawless violence, as well as decrees promulgated by the president are unconstitutional. The president likewise cannot take over privately owned public utility or business affected with public interest without prior legislation. Please note, ladies and gentlemen, that when we read Article 12, Section 17, the operative phrase there is the state. It is not the president. It is not Congress. It is Congress enacting emergency, an emergency powers law and delegating the execution or the implementation of the emergency powers to the president. So the power to grant emergency emergency measures Congress, but is delegated to the president in so far as Article uh, 12, Section 17 in relation to Article 6, Section 23, Paragraph 2 is concerned. It is clear that Presidential Proclamation 1017 is not a declaration of martial law. It is merely an exercise of President Arroyo's calling out power for the armed forces to assist her in preventing or suppressing lawless violence. President Arroyo could validly declare the existence of a state of national emergency, even in the absence of a congressional enactment. However, the exercise of emergency powers, such as the taking over of privately owned public utility or business affected which requires a valid delegation of legislative power from Congress. Courts have often said that constitutional provisions in pare materia are to be construed together. Otherwise stated, different clauses, sections, and provisions of a constitution which relate to the same subject matter will be construed together and considered in the light of each other. Considering that section 17 of article 12 and section 23 of article six previously quoted relate to national emergencies, they must be read together to determine the limitation of the exercise of emergency powers. These po emergency powers must always be narrowly tailored, especially if it violates the Bill of Rights, because then it would undergo the strict scrutiny test. Generally, Congress is the repository of emergency powers. This is evident in the tenor of section 23, paragraph two, article six, authorizing it to delegate such powers to the president. Certainly a body cannot delegate a power not reposed upon it. Now this is the Youngstown case, uh, which, which is in all fours with, uh, the taking over of a private business. In David versus Arroyo, it involved the Daily Tribune. In, in the Youngstown case, it involved, uh, in April 1952, President Harry S. Truman issued an executive order directing the Secretary of Commerce, Charles Sawyer, to seize and operate most of the nation's steel mills. This was done in order to avert the expected effects of a strike by the United Steelworkers of America. 
the court held that the president did not have the authority to issue such an order. The court found that there was no congressional statute that authorized the president to take possession of private property. The court also held that the president's military power as commander in chief of the armed forces did not extend to labor disputes. The court argued that the president's power to see that the laws are faithfully executed refutes the idea that he is to be a lawmaker. Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer. Now, of recent vintage is Lagman versus Medialdia involving proclamation number uh, 216. Proclamation number 216 was declared not unconstitutional, not unconstitutional on the ground that there was a factual basis for the declaration, that there was a rebellion and public safety required it. In 2018, uh, uh, that threat, that, th that threat still existed. So the rebellion still existed. So the extension of martial law under proclamation number 216 was questioned. The court ruled that the rebellion persisted as to satisfy the first condition for the extension of martial law or for the suspension or of the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus. And public safety requires it under the second condition for the extension. Let's go back to the present day public health concerns, especially since the first quarter of 2020. Now, in my notes, I, I placed a factual timeline, but at this point, I will just uh, summarize um, this timeline. So the timeline starts from December uh, 2019 until the present, April 2020. Sometime December 12, uh, 2019, um, the first uh, uh, people exhibited uh, symptoms of a, a flu-like illness that was first identified in Wuhan, uh, China. But at that point, uh, little did everybody know that it would be a, a serious threat to public health beyond the borders of, of, in fact, even Wuhan. In fact, beyond the borders of that, uh, of that hospital. But it was on December 30, uh, 2019, when the director of the emergency department of the Wuhan uh, Central Hospital, Dr. Ai Fen, uh, received some very uh, disturbing um, medical reports involving a patient which was labeled SARS coronavirus. Dr. Ai Fen um, was the first doctor to have ordered tests on, the, on these early coronavirus uh, patients. Based on this report, 
by Dr. Ai Fen, another doctor, an ophthalmologist, Dr. Li Wenliang, uh, was alarmed. And uh, after, after reading the patient's report from Dr. Uh, Ai Fen, who encircled uh, the word SARS in her uh, report. Dr. Uh, Li Wenliang warned colleagues about a new coronavirus uh, strain via social media. In this case, from the WeChat uh, platform. Um, Dr. Ifen, in, in an interview, mentioned that uh, she was not the whistle whistleblower in this case. Uh, uh, she, she identified herself as the person who gave the whistle, but not, not the whistleblower himself. It was, uh, it was Dr. Li Wenliang who, who made no, who, who, who informed his colleagues in the entire world of this new strain of the SARS uh, uh, coronavirus. By December 31st, uh, uh, China alerts the World Health Organization to, to this type of pneumonia-like uh, uh, symptoms of uh, this uh, respiratory uh, disease. So flu-like uh, cases uh, came about and there was an outbreak of pneumonia affecting dozens of patients in, in Wuhan. Uh, Chinese authorities, uh, by, on the last day of the year, uh, treated many cases, dozens of cases of uh, pneumonia, uh, which was of unknown cause. Uh, the government uh, in, in Wuhan confirmed that uh, health authorities were treating dozens of cases. By January 1st, 2020, they closed, they, they, they traced uh, uh, this, this unknown uh, virus from uh, to a seafood market in Wuhan. And so the Huanan uh, seafood wholesale market in Wuhan was ordered closed by, by Chinese authorities uh, on January 1st, 2020. By January 3rd, um, Chang Airport in, in Singapore uh, began screening uh, uh, passengers who entered Singapore. It was the first uh, it, 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 it was the first uh, airport to do so. So temperature screening uh, was made, thermal detectors to uh, determine uh, signs of illness. Now from January 7 till the present, uh, there, there was a progression of events uh, both from, as it spread throughout the entire world from Wuhan to other parts of China, to other parts of, of the world. And uh, well, unfortunately, uh, the Philippines um, earns uh, the historical uh, ignominy to have the first case of, uh, the, of the disease um, within its shores which was a 38 year old uh, Chinese woman. So in January 30, uh, the first case out, outside uh, uh, China uh, was in the Philippines. On that date, January 30th, uh, the, the World Health Organization declared a global health uh, emergency. So uh, screening tests were, were um, conducted but once again, another, uh, an, another historical fact is that on February 2nd, uh, the first death outside of China and the first death in the Philippines was, uh, was recorded on the 2nd of February. The 38 year old Chinese woman. But there were many, many uh, cases. And uh, so on March 9th, uh, President Duterte 
formally declared a state of public health emergency and announced a partial lockdown, a community quarantine. Uh, Vice President Robredo likewise uh, addressed the public about uh, the coronavirus uh, disease. Now, in the series of progressions from a general community quarantine to the present um, enhanced community quarantine, um, let me just uh, two declarations were made: a, a uh, state of uh, public health emergency, as well as a state of calamity. In a state of, of of calamity, what becomes operative here is that. Uh, a state of calamity involves a, a natural disaster and oftentimes um, in a state of calamity, it is the National Disaster Reduction Risk, uh, uh, the National Disaster uh, Risk Reduction Management, uh, um, the National uh, Disaster uh, Risk Reduction and Management Council. Uh, that is called upon. But in this case, um, a state of public health emergency uh, requires a, a, a public health response and uh, an interagency uh, inter task force um, for, emerging and, uh, for emerging infectious diseases uh, was convened by the president. Now we, we spoke about uh, Dr. Ifen um, on December 30th. By March 29th, uh, the, she was uh, she was reported missing in China. Now extensions are have been prevalent. There was an extension uh, uh, two weeks ago. However, uh, let me just uh, let me just update uh, everyone. Two laws were, pa were passed, one in the 2019 and one earlier this year. The first law was Public Act number uh, 11332. And the second law was Republic Act 1146. 11332 addresses a public health emergency. But additional powers were asked by the president to fully address the situation. Now we will get to 11469 in, in, in a few minutes. However, may I just update you on um, the recent, uh, the recent um, um, events which, which uh, transpired uh, just today. The president just approved the extension of the enhanced community quarantine in selected regions, provinces, and cities nationwide until May 15, 2020. Now, let me just uh, these are these were in the high risk areas.
Now, in what category, you may ask, in what category does a public health emergency belong to? A national health, a national emergency due to public health concerns belongs in the category of a national emergency necessitating a civil defense response. Why does a public health emergency belong in this category, the category of a national emergency necessitating a uh, civil defense response? A public health emergency such as the coronavirus disease pandemic necessitates the expertise of medical doctors and allied medical professionals, as well as public health authorities, preferably epidemi epidemiologists and in infectious disease experts, as well as other specialists as the lead agents in a national public health crisis, which now threatens the right to health of the people under Article 2, Section 15 of the Constitution. The government response has been threefold. First was the declaration of a state of public health emergency involving presidential proclamation number 922, which rendered operative Republic Act 11332 the declaration of a state of calamity under presidential proclamation number 929 and the, the enactment of Republic Act 11469, which is read in relation to Republic Act 11332. Now we have discussed uh, uh, the types of emergency powers. First, you have the commander-in-chief powers in case of invasion or rebellion when the public safety uh, requires it. Then there is a declaration of a state of war, as in Araneta versus Dinglaza, which is a power reposed exclusively in Congress. Congress has the sole authority to declare a state of war. And uh, another type of emergency powers involves the declaration of a state of emergency, which is exercised by the president upon prior authorization by Congress. Now, I just want you to look at uh, these provisions, Article 6, Section 18. Uh, the Commander-in-Chief Clause. Now we have likewise discussed the graduated powers of the Commander-in-Chief Clause, the calling out power, the power to suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus, and uh, uh, the martial law power. From the, from, from the most to the least benign of powers as categorized by Justice Team. Likewise, the constitutional basis of the declaration or of uh, the granting of emergency powers is Article 6, Section 23, uh, Paragraph 2. The power of Congress to declare a state of war is under Article 6, Section 23, Paragraph 1. We did likewise discuss Article 17, uh, Article 12, rather, Section 17, involving in times of national emergency, when the public interest so requires, the state may, during the emergency and under reasonable terms prescribed by it, temporarily take over or direct the operation of any privately owned public utility or business affected with public interest. 
we cannot um, overemphasize the fact that emergency powers Now let's look at Republic Act 11469, the Bayanihan to Heal as One Act, uh, which I'd like to call the Emergency Powers Law uh, 2020. It may be, it can come in the form of special powers or authorized powers, but just the same, the purpose of the law is to meet the existing public health emergency. Now, in my notes, I, I mentioned these, uh, these, um, uh, these laws, as well as uh, pertinent provisions. I, I want you to, to have a look at, at those, but let me, let me invite your attention to, uh, well, aside from the declared uh, national policy, let me invite your attention to the construction or interpretation of the law under um, section seven therein. Nothing in Republic Act number 11469 shall be construed as an impairment, restriction, or modification of the provisions of the constitution. In case the exercise of the powers herein granted conflicts with other statutes, orders, rules, or regulations, the provisions of this act shall prevail. Note that consistent with Marbury versus Madison, if there is, if, if there is a conflict between the constitution and, and a provision of law, it is the constitution that prevails. But in addition to that, uh, with respect to other laws, uh, Republic Act number 11469 uh, and its provisions uh, would prevail with respect to other laws and not the constitution. It's the constitution that is the standard or the measure of uh, how the emergency powers are defined limited and exercised. Now, uh, section four involves uh, authorized powers, but let me just invite your attention further on certain comments which uh, um, which, uh, which I have on this, uh, on this law. Generally, generally, the law enjoys a presumption of constitutionality, constitutionality rather. And uh, in fact, uh, the aim or the purpose of Republic Act 11469 in relation to Republic Act 1332 is to address public health concerns on this global pandemic. And therefore, emergency powers. The first order of the day would be to look at 11332 um, first and 11469. Uh, 11469, uh, it would seem that on one authorized power that will prove uh, useful is perhaps uh, um, doing away uh, with, with uh, public bidding in, in the procurement of uh, protective personal equipment as well as medical supplies 
ventilators or respirators uh, in order to expedite uh, the process. So in terms of medical equipment, uh, that is in dire need in the Philippines today. Medical supplies, masks, uh, other equipment, um, ventilators. Um, and, and so um, this would require extraordinary powers because under the normal course of events, this would undergo the government procurement law. But because of the exigencies of the moment, because of the emergency at hand. Um, we need these supplies at the earliest possible time. And therefore emergency powers can be exercised, obtain or procure these either in the form of donations or in the form of an outright purchase. Now at this time, let me just uh, uh, invite your attention to um, my comments on my, my, my further comments on Republic Act number 11469. Uh, I actually have very few comments on Republic Act number 11469. Um, in these times, uh, well, um, uh, these, these prevent provisions are well-meaning. However, there are certain provisions that were not narrowly tailored. And so they are a cause for concern among um, lawyers, especially uh, constitutional law uh, professors. Now, with respect to Republic Act 11469, um, um, I made a two-part analysis of Section 6F, and uh, this is what Section 6F uh, states. Individuals or groups creating perpetual perpetrating or spreading false information regarding the coronavirus disease crisis on social media and other platforms. Such information having no valid or beneficial effect on the population and are clearly geared to promote chaos, panic, anarchy, fear, or confusion, and those participating in cyber incidents that make use or take advantage of current crisis situation, prey public through scams, phishing, uh, fraudulent emails, or other similar acts. Now, um, the intention of Section 6F may be noble, but it was not narrowly tailored, and I will show you why. I divided it into two parts. First, involve false information, and the second, those participating in cyber events, uh, cyber incidents rather, that make use or take advantage of the crisis situation to prey on the public through scams, phishing, uh, fraudulent emails, or other similar acts. Now for the first part, it involves false information. It would seem that a facial challenge for being constitutionally infirm is readily apparent uh, on two grounds. First involves the vagueness doctrine and second involves the overbreadth doctrine. It's both vague and overbroad and I will explain why. The void for vagueness doctrine may be explained as follows. A statute or a provision thereof is void for vagueness and unenforceable if it is too vague for a person of average intelligence to understand 
or if a term cannot be strictly defined and is not defined anywhere in such a law. If an average person cannot generally determine what persons are regulated, what conduct is prohibited, or what punishment may be imposed. So it's, it's not clear what, what, is, what constitutes false information. There's no, there's no definition of what false information is. It likewise suffers the infirmity of overbreadth. A law is overbroad if it substantially prohibits conduct protected by the Constitution, such as forms of protected speech. If you look at false information, it, it, can, it can fall within the realm of political speech, certain types of information that is given. Political speech, um, as we know in our studies of constitutional law, has the highest protection under Article 3, Section 4. Political speech, which is constitutionally protected speech, may be included in Section 6F on false information. Now, granting the law has, has nobody questions the law based on these uh, uh, facial challenges. Could it be that there is an as applied challenge? In specific instances, section 6F may be challenged if it violates article three, uh, section four in specific instances. Firstly, what constitutes false information regarding the COVID-19 crisis? Supposing if it's not regarding the COVID-19 crisis, if it's some other type of ailment. So if there is false information, there must be information that is genuine or information that is true. So is truth now a defense? Who determines whether the information has any valid or beneficial effect on the population? So it will now be subject to interpretation. So the law has to be narrowly tailored to be able to reflect what constitutes false information, especially regarding the COVID-19 crisis and not just false information on anything. Now, clearly, when you, when you look at it, uh, the, 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 the objectives are noble. To prom um, those types of information that promote chaos, panic, anarchy, fear, or confusion. Um, of course, uh, that is the ideal to, 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 to have uh, information that is only truthful. But the language of the law is in this manner. That the false information that, is, that, that may be given are clearly geared to promote chaos, panic, anarchy, fear, or confusion. If it is not clearly geared to promote the aforementioned objectives, is good faith then a defense? Now, let's look at Republic Act uh, number 11469, Section 6F, and, uh, and Article 3, Section 4 of the Constitution on freedom of expression. Now, granting someone is charged under, under, under the first part of, of Section 6F, it must pass through the, 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 the crucible of the clear and present danger test with respect for, to that information. Chavez versus Gonzalez. A governmental action that restricts freedom of speech of the press based on content is given the strictest scrutiny with the government having the burden of overcoming the presumed constitutionality by the clear and present danger rule. This rule applies equally to all kinds of media, including broadcast media during that time, 2008. So definitely in 2020, 
this now includes social media. So by analogy, Chavez versus Gonzalez will, will apply to social media. In the famous dissenting opinion of Justice Holmes in Abrams versus United States, in how he defined what a clear and present danger is. So the clear and present danger test is applied in this manner. The question in every case is whether the words used are in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that the Congress has a right to prevent. It is a question of proximity and degree. So if there is a clear and present danger when it comes to that type of information, um, then that speech or that, that information can be suppressed if there's a clear and present danger test, if there's a clear and present danger. Now, May I, may, may, I, may I propose an additional test, which is a modification of the clear and present danger test. It is called the imminent lawless action test exemplified in Brandenburg versus Ohio. In the imminent lawless action test, the, the US Supreme Court here held that the government cannot punish inflammatory speech as that speech is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. There are three elements of this test. There is an intent to speak. There is imminence of lawlessness or imminence of this action. And there is likelihood of lawlessness. So if the degree of imminence of that lawless action is apparent, it is justified to uh, suppress that speech. But who determines it? There may be varying interpretations to that information. Some people may not even mind that sort of information. Others may take it seriously. But if men of or, or people of average intelligence um, interpret the words, they must create either a clear and present danger or, an Im or some kind of imminent lawless action. If it results, if in allowing that information to be circulated in social media, were to be uh, tolerated, uh, if imminent lawless action is, is, is apparent, then it would be possible to suppress that speech. But it must pass the crucible of either the clear and present danger test or the imminent lawless action test. In a Philippine case, MVRF, Publications Incorporated versus Islamic Dawa Council of the Philippines. The imminent lawless action test is like why of, of Brandenburg versus Ohio was, was discussed in this manner. Advocacy of illegal action becomes punishable only if such advocacy is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce action, except in unusual instances, Brandenburg protects the advocacy of lawlessness as long as such speech is not translated into action. So if it's just a mere thought process um, without any act, without any positive act, then there is no imminent lawless action. But if that thought is translated into action, then um, 
those words or the, the information that was what that was placed on social media is uh, is punishable. Now this is also if if you will notice um, if cases are filed in court based on on section 6f or some other statute involving false information or false news or cyber libel or libel um, in many many instances the best remedy is to counter speech with other speech to counter falsity with the truth and this brings us to the counter speech doctrine. In the words of Justice Anthony Kennedy, a decision which best exemplifies the counter speech doctrine, uh, counter speech, uh, counter bad, there, there, there is a, uh, there, there is a remedy of countering bad speech with good speech, of countering negative speech with positive speech. Thus, government should counter false speech with truthful speech as opposed to engaging in raw censorship and stark oppression. In the words of Justice Anthony Kennedy, in United States versus Alvarez, which best exemplifies the counter speech doctrine. The remedy for speech that is false is speech that is true. This is the ordinary course for a free society. The response to the unreasoned is the rational, to the uninformed, the enlightened, to the straight out lie, the simple truth. Justice Brandeis, in his concurring opinion in Whitney versus California, had this to say about enforcing account, the, the counter speech doctrine. If there be a time to expose through discussion the falsehood and fallacies, to avert the evil by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech, not enforced silence. Of course, this type of counter speech may be rendered operative if there is no less clear and present danger or if there is no imminent lawless action. So counter speech in ordinary cases may be, uh, may be resorted to but only in cases where there is a clear and present danger and uh, is not lawless action, will that speech be uh, punishable? Now, the second part involves uh, cyber incidents through scams, phishing, fraudulent emails or other similar acts. If you look through the law, those participating in cyber incidents that make use or take advantage of the current crisis situation to prey on the public through scams, phishing, fraudulent emails, or other similar acts. Now, in this case, there may be a, a possibility for a facial challenge on the ground of vagueness because there's no definition of what are cy cyber incidents. What are scams? What, are, what is phishing? Even if we, we do know it, what are fraudulent, e what constitutes fraudulent emails? Law has to be narrowly tailored and, and section 6F sucks from the, these facial infirmities. But for this second part on cyber incidents, it, is, um, it, it, um, it, it suffers from being vague. 
if you will notice, section 6F may be vague, but it is not overbroad. Why is it not overbroad? Because it limits commercial speech. And unlike political speech, commercial speech may have limited constitutional protection. Okay, let's, let's now continue. Uh, we are now in the, in the area of commercial speech. Commercial speech has limited constitutional uh, protection. And uh, uh, I will show you, show you why. Uh, in Hudson test. Commercial speech has limited constitutional protection and thus may be subject to government regulation. It is entitled to less protection than political speech and can be regulated if false or misleading. So Congress had the right idea here to limit commercial speech. However, it just needs to be narrowly tailored. There needs to be definitions on what are cyber incidents, what is phishing, what are fraudulent emails and the like. At the outset, we must determine whether the expression is protected by the free speech clause. For commercial speech to come within that provision, it at least must, con must concern lawful activity and not be misleading. Next, we, we ask whether the asserted governmental interest is substantial. If both inquiries yield positive answers, we must determine whether the regulation directly advances the governmental interest and the governmental interest asserted and whether it is not more extensive than necessary to serve that interest. Central Hudson Gas and Electric Power Corporation versus Public Service Corporation Commission. Thus, the Central Hudson test presents the following questions for the court. Does the speech concern a lawful activity and is not misleading? If it meets these requirements, then there are other questions to answer. Does the government have a substantial interest? Does the regulation directly and materially advance the government's substantial interest? Is the regulation narrowly tailored? If the speech is fraudulent, illegal, and misleading, then it is not protected commercial speech. And the second part of section 6F has the right idea. You, you punish commercial speech that is, that, uh, that is fraudulent, illegal, and misleading. In other words, um, people should not be allowed to profit from the miseries of others from fraud, from an illegal act, from misleading the public on certain cures. But the question before us is, is this regulation narrowly tailored? So that is the question that you need to, to, to answer. Because if it is narrowly tailored, then you apply the law. And if the speech is fraudulent, illegal, and misleading, then it is not protected commercial speech. You can punish the person who, uh, who sent the email. The Central Hudson test involves intermediate scrutiny analysis, as the government only has to invoke a substantial government interest rather than a compelling governmental interest, as in a strict scrutiny 
analysis or commercial speech. Commercial speech not only includes the right of the speaker to speak, but also the right of the listener to receive information. Even if this type of speech is protected, it does not mean that it is immune from government regulation. Commercial speech is entitled to less protection than political speech and can be regulated if false or misleading. Unlike with political speech, the truth of which may be difficult to ascertain, the court thought commercial advertising to be more objective and thus subject to determination of its truth content. So you must distinguish whether the type of speech that was placed in social media or that cyber incident is is within the realm of political speech or commercial speech. You have to make that distinction. Now, transfer of appropriations under Article 6, Section 25, Paragraph 5. With respect to, to the transfer of appropriations, uh, um, uh, this involves Raulio versus uh, um, Aquino. And, and um, it, it's just more of a guideline for the, for the implementers of Republic Act number 11649 involving the transfer of appropriated funds. The transfer of appropriated funds to be valid under section 25 paragraph five must be made upon a concurrence of the following requisites. There is a law authorizing the president, the president of the Senate, the speaker of the house, the chief justice of the Supreme Court and the heads of the constitutional commissions to transfer funds within their respective offices. So with the president only with respect to the executive department, with the president of the Senate only with respect to the Senate, with the speaker of the house only with respect to uh, uh, the House of Representatives, the Chief Justice within the judiciary, and the heads of the constitutional commissions within their respective constitutional commissions. Second, the funds to be transferred are savings generated from the appropriations for their respective offices. And third, the purpose of the transfer is to augment an item in the general appropriations law for their respective offices. Thus, cross-border transfers of the savings of the executive to augment appropriations of other offices outside uh, the executive is unconstitutional in Araulio versus Aquino with respect to the disbursement acceleration program. The office of the president cannot allocate funds found within the executive department or within his office or within his purview to that of the Senate or the House of Representatives or to other constitutional commissions. The, the, the transfer of savings must be within the executive department. So cross-border transfers of funds are unconstitutional. They are and cross-border augmentations from savings are likewise prohibited by the constitution. By providing the president, the president of the Senate, the speaker, the chief justice, and the constitutional commission heads, the authority to augment any item in the GAA for their respective offices, section 25 paragraph five has delineated borders between these, their offices such that funds appropriated for one office are prohibited from crossing over to another office, even in the guise of augmentation of a deficient item or items. Thus, we call such transfers of funds cross-border transfers or cross-border augmentations. Phrase respective offices used in section 25 paragraph 5 refers to the entire executive with respect to the president, the Senate with respect to the Senate president, the House of Representatives with respect to the speaker, 
the judiciary with respect to the chief justice, the constitutional commissions with respect to their respective chairpersons. Araulio versus Aquino. The next involves Republic Act number 11332, which is the Public Health Emergency Act, mandatory reporting of notifiable diseases and health events of public health concern. Pursuant to the policy under Article 2, Section 15 of the Constitution involving the right to protect and promote uh, the health of uh, the people and instill health consciousness among them, uh, Republic Act number 1332 was passed in 2019 expressly to, to address epidemic or pandemic emergencies. A declaration of uh, the policy, declaration of policy. Article 2, Section 15 is the policy of the state. The right of, to health of the people and to instill health consciousness among them. Now, may I call your attention to the second portion. The state also recognizes disease surveillance and response systems of the Department of Health and its local counterparts as the first line of defense to epidemics and health events of public health concern that pose risks to public health and security. So the first line of defense are the officials, the, doc the doctors and the professionals, the public health authorities. They are the first line of defense because they have the expertise, the special expertise to deal with uh, these kinds of public health emergencies, epidemics, and, and other health events of public health concern. Now with respect to the objectives under section four, may I just point out the underscoring. Uh, I, I supplied the underscoring for first line of defense to emphasize the, the importance of our health authorities and our uh, doctors, nurses, and other health officials in, in combating any type of epidemic or pandemic. So that is clear in the law, in its, in its declaration of policy. Now for section four, may I uh, may I invite your attention to, uh, well, this portion, section 4F, number three and number four, quarantine and isolation and rapid containment and implementation of measures for disease prevention and control. And, and uh, well, th that is the, uh, the basis for our uh, general community quarantine, and now the enhanced uh, uh, community quarantine. And uh, another objective, to respect to the fullest extent possible the rights of the people to liberty, body, bodily integrity, and privacy while maintaining and preserving public health and security. Under this act. So the mandate involves rapid containment, quarantine and isolation, disease prevention and control measures, as well as responsibilities for events of public health concern. All personnel of the DOH and its local counterparts and all other individuals or entities involved in conducting disease surveillance and response activities shall respect to the fullest extent possible the rights of people to liberty, bodily integrity, 
and privacy while maintaining and preserving public health and security. So, so there are prohibited acts. Well, uh, under Section 7, um, the president uh, uh, shall declare a state of public health emer emergency in the event of an epidemic of national and or international concern, which threatens national security in order to mobilize governmental and non-governmental agencies to respond to the threat. And, and, and clearly, uh, uh, Presidential Proclamation 922 uh, affirms uh, or, or, or uh, is, a, is, is uh, an example of the operation of Section uh, 7. Section 9 involves uh, uh, prohibited acts. So may I likewise call your attention to a certain type of prohibited act. So let's look at the disclosure of confidential information. Now, there are penalties. Now, let me just... Uh, provide you with certain comments. on this law. Now you'll notice uh, a few days ago, um, uh, there was this headline, government requires COVID-19 patients to disclose personal information to enhance contracting. That's not been a front to uh, um, a person's right to privacy, uh, especially under uh, the Data Privacy Act. Um, if you will notice, uh, Secretary uh, Carlo Nograles explained it very well. Um, what government will do is they will, they, uh, they will obtain a waiver. They will obtain a uh, consent from patients in order to disclose personal information to enhance contract, contact tracing. Uh, contact tracing is important because we have to know the root of the virus. So if we can, we can look at the root cause, we can, we can develop a cure for this. And, and so uh, Secretary Nograles uh, explained it well. It's, it's not exactly a, a, a violation of the data privacy law. There are exceptions and, and I will explain to you what this except, these exceptions are. Section 6G in relation to uh, nine, Section 9A and Section 9, uh, Paragraph 2. All personnel, uh, we already uh, um, got this a while ago. They are uh, they're first responders. So they are the first line of defense. Uh, but at the same time, they... Uh, there is a concomitant obligation to, to, to respect to the fullest extent possible the rights of people to liberty, bodily integrity, and privacy while maintaining and preserving public health and security. Prohibited acts, unauthorized disclosure of private and confidential information pertaining to a patient's uh, 
uh, medical condition or treatment. The disclosure of confidential information will not be considered a violation of this act under this section if the disclosure was made to comply with a legal order issued court of law with competent uh, jurisdiction. Health and medical records are sacrosanct. They constitute sensitive personal information of a person. Health and medical records are protected by the Data Privacy Act, Republic Act 10173. Since they are sensitive personal information, they are protected by the data privacy law. Now, what can we do? Let's read Republic Act number 10173 in relation to Republic Act number 11332. To ensure the compliance with the Data Privacy Act, there are two remedies that may be pursued. One may obtain a lawful order of a court of law, or one may obtain the consent of the patient. This is what uh, uh, Secretary Nograles was uh, saying. To, um, one may obtain the consent of the patient as the data subject to waive confidentiality on his health or medical records. So there are two remedies here, two exceptions that may exist. In order uh, to comply with both uh, uh, the data privacy law and uh, Republic Act 11332 on contact tracing. Now, uh, please, that the first line of defense are our um, are our uh, um, medical experts, our medical authorities, the doctors, the nurses, and allied medical professionals. But please note that in order for us to effectively address to effectively address uh, this global pandemic, to be able to strive for, well, in some areas containment, in other areas uh, mitigation. Uh, it requires the grassroots network of our local government units. So the success of this requires the, co the cooperation of both the national government and the local government units. So in this case, uh, Republic Act number 7160, the um, local government code, uh, especially section 105, uh, provides certain powers to the Secretary of Health. Now, in this case, Section 105 of the Local Government Code may be invoked to provide direct national supervision and control by the Secretary of Health. Note that this is a special power granted to the Secretary of Health in cases of epidemics, pestilence, and other widespread public health concerns and dangers. The, the Secretary of Health in this instance may upon the direction of president and in consultation with the local government unit uh, concerned, temporarily assume direct supervision and control over health operations in any local government unit for the duration of the emergency, but in no case exceeding a cumulative period of six months. With the concurrence of the government unit concerned, the period for such direct national control and supervision may be further uh, extended.
So if you will notice, to be able to be able to address this national emergency um, necessitating a civil defense response, it requires the, the cooperation of the national government, the local government units, and the first line defense in our uh, medical fields, in the different medical fields. And so it is not just one person or group of persons, it, it, it is all of us. And in fact, we are, we are uh, contributing through putting this information out to ensure that government is successful in, in addressing this global pandemic at the earliest possible time. Now, uh, oftentimes, uh, well, the Constitution is called upon, as I mentioned at the start of this lecture, the Constitution is placed in a difficult situation, oftentimes, to provide a delicate balance between liberty and security. But if you read the law in its totality, th there is no conflict between liberty and security. But they are part of the greater whole to preserve the state. The state which has four elements, people, territory, sovereignty, and government. And in that sense, uh, um, the Bill of Rights the constitution of liberty and the constitution of government go hand in hand in uh, providing for a stronger state structure. Now, to, re to recap our, um, our lecture for today, uh, I provided it in, in your notes, I divided it into constitutional provisions, uh, presidential proclamations, um, statutes passed by Congress, as well as uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence. So uh, by way of, of summary, uh, let's look at uh, in order to in order to um, address or at, when at, when at, uh, in studying the law dealing with national emergencies due to public health concerns. Um, you need to look at Article 2, Section 5, 15, Article 6, Section 23, Paragraph 2, uh, Article 6, Section 25, Paragraph 5, uh, Commander-in-Chief uh, Clause under Section 18 of Article 7, uh, the power of the state, during national emergencies to, to temporarily take over or direct operation of any privately owned business uh, under Article 12, Section 17. Uh, the power of general supervision over local governments by the president under Article 10, Section 4. Uh, the Bill of Rights, uh, the Grave Abuse Clause under Article uh, 8, Section 1, uh, as well as uh, Article 10, Sections two and three and section five involving local autonomy and decentralization of administration of, of, of uh, local government units. Now, um, for purposes of the COVID-19 crisis, um, you may look at Presidential Proclamation 922 and Pres Presidential Proclamation 929. Uh, with respect to statutes passed by Congress, uh, the two that I mentioned, uh, Republic Act 11469, Republic Act 11332, uh, the Local Government Code, as well as the Data Privacy Act. As for cases, uh, I just to, to, to summarize, uh, Araneta versus Tinglasan, Lansang versus Garcia, Integrated Bar of the Philippines versus Zamora, Luxon versus Perez, 
San Lacas versus Executive uh, Secretary, uh, David versus Arroyo, Youngstown Sheep and Tube uh, Company versus Sawyer, and Araulio versus uh, Aquino. Um, I will be happy to, to answer any of your questions, uh, if you have any. And uh, uh, thank you for your time, uh, for listening. Um, So one additional thing, um, well, I hope everybody is doing fine. Uh, uh, please stay safe and healthy, and hopefully we will be, be back uh, studying the law firsthand uh, uh, fairly soon. So if, if, would you have any, any questions? I'll be happy to, uh, to answer any of the questions. Yes, uh, uh, there, there is a question here. Um, the LGUs are imposing their own uh, community quarantine and uh, enhanced community quarantine measures through an executive order. Is this valid? Is an ordinance the appropriate action? Of course, ordinances are always, always strengthens uh, the legal basis but on, under the circumstances uh, what governs what what governs uh, our situation involves the the application of republic act number 11649 in relation to republic act 11332 what may perhaps be apparent here is that um, Local government units are are, are enforcing um, the community quarantine and, and enhanced community quarantine of those uh, of of Republic Act uh, one one three three two. That in it in itself 
is the legal basis. So the legal basis is Republic Act 11332, as well as its implementing rules and regulations. Now with respect to, to other types of, of uh, incidents, um, ordinances are the proper vehicle to, to affect specific types of measures in a community. But uh, essentially, Republic Act 11332 already covers it in relation to Republic Act 11469. Now, um, of course, when it comes to the penalties, the reason why ordinances are are um, should be uh, should be passed is that there are specific uh, penalties imposed by the laws provided by by Congress. But when it comes to the implementation on the local level, um, there may be some, uh, uh, some disparity from the penalties imposed by the national laws. Because what the local chief executives are imposing are in fact uh, the national law, which is passed by Congress, that emergency as directed or, or, or as... Uh, uh, as, uh, as provided for by the president. Remember, it is the president here who has a, a direct hand in imposing this uh, quarantine. Um, the executive order is merely a manifestation of that. But um, if the local Sangguniangs pass an ordinance, it would be clearer with respect to certain violations because there may be violations that, that have um, um, imprisonment for, uh, for one week or overnight, or uh, there is no uniform, there is no uniform um, um, implementation of the penalty. And a, an ordinance can, can address that to at least make it uniform for that local government unit. Now, with respect to curfews, well, what is instructive here is uh, Spark versus City of uh, versus Quezon City, Navotas, and Manila. In Spark, it requires a a local ordinance, unless it is imposed on a national level as part of the quarantine. But, in or, but to add strength, to add clear legal basis from the standpoint of the local government units, an ordinance providing for uh, a limitation on, on the number of hours, um, a number of hours uh, out in order to, to prevent the spread of the virus may be possible under an ordinance. The legal base in will be uh, Act 113332 in relation to Republic Act 11649. Is there any other question? Um, let, let's check.
maybe another five minutes to, uh, to entertain questions. If there are any other questions, uh, well, you, you can send it through the, the Philippine Association of Law Schools uh, um, messenger thread, and, and we will be happy to, uh, to answer your, your, your questions. Um, of course, we, we live in uncertain times, uh, and in these, uh, in these, uh, in these times, uh, well, um, it's best to get the right type of information in order to make informed decisions, whether it is a, a medical manner, matter or a uh, legal matter. Um, I guess at, at this time, if there, if there are no, um, no other questions, uh, may, may I thank uh, all of you viewers uh, uh, for listening this afternoon. I, I hope that uh, this lecture uh, puts into perspective uh, um, uh, the need to be more, uh, more, more critical and more, more uh, discerning with the way we, we view the law. Uh, it, it's important that um, lawyers and law students um, are able to look at the finer points of the law. And, and that is the purpose of this uh, PALS lecture series, to be able to, to prepare you for the practice of law. And, and for those that, that listen um, who are not uh, law students, um, well, uh, thank you for listening. I hope the information was, was also uh, useful to you. Um, So our next our next um, uh, speaker uh, will be next week. Uh, I think it will be Dean Nilo Divina of the UST Faculty of Civil Law, who, who is uh, um, one of the foremost experts in the Corporation Code. So uh, you will have you will have an excellent lecture next week. Um, thank you once again, and uh, well, uh, let's keep 
are the conversation going, uh, whether in pals or in social media. Stay safe and healthy, and uh, well, we hope to see you all soon. Uh, thank you, and a pleasant good afternoon to all.